Patel and inviting him onto the stage. Please come. Thank you, Amit, for accepting our invitation once again. Everybody looks forward to your talks on both the budget and TDS, and we're really happy that you say yes to us all the time. Uh, let me start with the, you know, for these sessions, these days I've not been saying anything about money life, but there are new faces all the time. Last week I discovered that many people don't even know what we do. So Money Life Foundation is a not-for-profit organization. It uh, is the voice of savers. We like to say that we put savers first. We have 39,000 members nationwide and we've conducted 273 workshops and seminars so far. Most of you have been coming for our daily guidance sessions. If you look at that board out there, we have something different happening every day. Why don't all you guys go and sit down please, so that people can see. So before you leave, you might want to click a picture of that so that you can take advantage of everything else that we do with help and housing and cooperative issues, waste management and other seminars. Membership to Money Life Foundation is free. You fill a feedback form, you become a member. We take your feedback seriously, so please do fill up forms or email us and tell us what you think about our programs, what kind of sessions would you like, would you like us to have, you know, certain other seminars, speakers, we make our best effort to get them when we get persistent uh, requests, not just one-off, okay. Also, these activities function and can be run uh, because we get donations from people, that is important, so if you like our work, please feel free to donate. Uh, Money Life Foundation can take foreign donations as well as the ATG donations. I'm now going to ask Devashish Basu to introduce Amit Patel. But before I do that, may I ask Mr. Abhay Datar to welcome him with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> may I now ask Devashish to introduce Amit Patel, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Sachit so has already mentioned a few words about him, but um, Mr. Patel is, <coughs> is a very, very accomplished and a brilliant chartered accountant. He's, he's been, um, he's a rank holder at the All India level and has been in private practice ever since he qualified in 1986. He did his articleship with one of the most reputed firms of that time, that is SV Catalia and Associates. And now, currently, he's a partner at Manohar Chaudhary and Associates. He has spent a large part of his professional career dealing with taxation matters and in the past few years has focused on tax matters specifically related to the financial sector that like FII's, banks, mutual funds, <coughs> qualified financial institutions and also foreign portfolio investors. His core practice consists of tax planning, appeals, representations and even IT issues. He is an independent director and member of the audit committee of the LIC Housing Finance, one of the largest housing finance companies in the country. He is also an independent director at B4U Television Network India and B4U Broadband India and also the chairman of the audit committees of both these companies. Uh, <coughs> Amit takes a lot of interest in study, knowledge, research, etc. And he is a member of the journal committee, international tax committee, HR and TI committee of the and co-chairman of the taxation committee of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society which is a voluntary body of CAs of, and has a membership of 9,200 people from CAs across, the, across India. He headed the BCAs in 2009-2010 in 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 as its president and was elected member of its managing committee from 1998 to 99 um, and has also served in various positions like honorary treasurer, joint secretary for several years. He has been a member of the various committees such as taxation, indirect tax, journal, seminar, public relations, professional development and so on. He has been actively involved with the activities of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, the Western Indian Regional Council, has been a part of the technical committee and also a member of the expert group constituted to suggest changes in the syllabus for the IT related papers of the CA curriculum. He is a member of the finance and taxation panel of CII's Western Region and also of the Bombay Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He is a co-author of various publications of BCAS such as K 
calculators to computers, a paradigm shift, shares and securities, taxation and accounting, tax deduction at source, FAQs on ETDS, he's an expert in TDS as we can see. Amit has never hesitated to share his knowledge whenever possible. He's been a regular speaker in various seminars and conferences organized by the ICAI, BCAS, ASOCHAM, CII, private banks, income tax departments, regional training institutes, rotary clubs and other bodies. His articles have appeared in various magazines and websites including Money Life where he's, run, he's done several cover stories and they're all very, very well accepted. And he's also written for CNBC's moneycontrol.com, Tax Sutra, Journals of the BCAS and ICA, as I already mentioned. He's also appeared on several programs on national television and his views are regularly quoted in newspapers and websites. And he's very active on various social and professional media networks. With this introduction, may I now invite Nick to come and please make his presentation. Thank you, Debashesh and Suchita for calling me once again to Money Life. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that we are starting this uh, you know, series of lectures or talks on the basics of income tax. As a, as a practicing chartered accountant, uh, having dealt with clients from you know, different uh, sectors, different types of clients, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the, the literacy levels as far as taxation is concerned in the country are very, very pitiable. And people just don't know things about tax. And uh, therefore, it, it's, it's and it's not that as a chartered accountant, I love that the you know tax laws are complex because it gives me more work. Uh, that is of course there that you know the more complex the laws, that, you know the more the demand for chartered accountants. But the point is that for us as professionals, at least to the type of uh, breed of CAs that I belong to, it's a big headache if the client is not tax literate. You know. We would love to have a person who understands taxes, who understands the problems that we face while dealing with taxation and keeps his or her house in order uh, because then it makes life easy for us uh, in terms of advising the client, in terms of doing the compliances. So therefore, uh, as we go forward, if, if we have more lectures where I am also there, my objective would be to try and touch the basics and get them instilled in you so that you understand why certain provisions of the law are there and why certain problems occur both from the taxpayer side, from the tax consultant side and from the department side. Unless we understand each other's problems, I think it, there cannot be a win-win situation. Of course, in tax, there is nothing like a win-win situation. Taxpayer always feels he is losing and the tax department always feels that that guy is a crook and he is not paid what he is supposed to. But I think with the with the kind of uh, proactive government that we have today, uh, while there may be different views on that, but I feel it is a proactive government and is uh, you know trying to reach out to people and understand and solve the problems. I think if ever there was a time when we could have solved our problems, at least on the tax front, this is it. If this if this point of time goes away in our lives, I think we have a very dismal uh, future as far as uh, you know cooperation is concerned. So therefore. Uh, going forward, this would be our uh, uh, endeavor. <coughs> Today's talk is on TDS. The question is, is it TDS? Is it TDS or a complete TDS? You know, I think by the end of the day, let's all decide what, what, which, what it is. You know, what is TDS? So as I said, let's look at the very basics because unless you, we understand why TDS is there, what is TDS, we will not appreciate the issues that come up in terms of TDS. So first of all, TDS aims at collection of revenue uh, at the very source of income, what tax deducted at source. So at the source of the income, the tax gets deducted. It is essentially an indirect method therefore of collecting tax, which combines the concept of pay as you earn and collect as it is being earned. The mechanism of TDS therefore puts the onus of compliance on the person who or the, on the company on the entity that pays a particular sum of money to somebody else so the the government has basically outsourced the 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 duty of the government of revenue collection onto certain categories of people and tax is deducted at the time while making payments or at the time of credit 
which is very important to understand that it is not merely uh, you know tax deduction does not happen at the time of only payment but it has to happen at the time of the credit into the books of the payer or at the time of payment whichever is earlier so the the incidence of deduction of tax is preponed to either the date of credit in the books or to the date of payment whichever is earlier and then it is deposited into the government treasury the objective of tds is to spread the burden of tax payment by paying taxes as it is earned to ensure effective collection of taxes and to uh, time for the timely mobilization of the internal revenues but very importantly and this is becoming more and more important from the government's perspective from the income tax department's perspective is that it is an important source of information for ascertaining the income and expenditure of a taxpayer during assessments the tds returns that the deductors file are a gold mine as far as the tax department is concerned because based on that they are assessing the people in this room the people outside the room it's it's a gold mine of information for the tax department so that is something that we need to keep in mind advantages i mean i don't know whether anybody will say there can be advantages but there are the advantages are first of all it shares the responsibility between the deductor and the tax collection agency this is obviously from the government's perspective part of the burden is passed on it prevents tax evasion it's good for the country widens the tax collection base definitely good for the country because we have a very pitiable number of tax payers in the country as compared to 125 crores that we have of people <coughs> steady source of revenue for the government if you are doing a business you would know that for business you need working capital for daily expenses for salaries for rent for electricity the government is also like an organization the government also requires working capital it has to pay salaries to the government servants it has to pay all kinds of you know operational expenses so basically tds is a form of working capital for the government and uh, it is easier for a deductee uh, the, the concept of tds has an advantage from a deductee's perspective because the deductee uh, the, the tax gets automatically deducted or collected and deposited to the credit central government and therefore we as taxpayers don't have the headache of paying that separately to the government so so that is one headache taken away from the uh, taxpayers uh, shoulders so those of you who are salaried people for example you would know that from your salary tax gets deducted let us take a situation where tds is not there the em employer does not deduct tax then obviously you will need to yourself pay the tax so that is a headache because every four ma every three months you will have to pay advance tax fill up a chalan go to the bank make the payment etc so that headache is taken away from the deductees by virtue of the tds provisions when in, in so what are the different sections in the in the advertisement uh, of for this particular talk it was said that i'll refer to the why is and the what and when and the different sections so these are the different sections now you need not you know bother about how, how many sections are there etc the only objective of putting this slide before you is to explain to to demonstrate how complicated life has become for a tax deductor as well as a tax deductee let's take the first one 19 <coughs> sorry section 192 which asks a employer an employer to deduct tax from the salary paid to the employees in certain obviously if the salary income is about taxable limit when to deduct the employer has to deduct on a monthly basis every month the salary is paid every month the tax is deducted uh interest on securities less for the time being keep it aside it is hardly relevant now but 194a which i'm sure most people in this room or at at your home would be facing this is 194a where tax gets deducted from interest other than interest on security so you have a bank interest you have a fd you have a uh, you have a deposit with a fixed deposit with a company for example uh, those kind of interest or you are given a loan to someone and that person pays you interest that interest will attract tds under section 194a and at the time of credit or payment whichever is earlier that person who is paying you interest or who is supposed to pay you interest that person will have to deduct the tax at source 194b winning from lotteries and puzzles most common people we are not concerned with it but just on a lighter vein you know when we watch tv shows like uh you know jhalak um, dikhla ja or all that kind of stuff kaun banega karodpati you know mr bachchan who is right now at the center of a big controversy 
he uses a fancy mob like uh, pen and signs the check for 1 crore rupees and shows it you know access bank check and they they display it that is all crap you know because that check will be taken back immediately after the camera is switched off because they cannot give a 1 crore check because they have to deduct tax at source so winnings from lotteries puzzles game shows etc attract a tax which is at the highest <coughs> highest rate so that 1 crore never goes to that we'll get only after the tax is deducted 194c another very important area of uh, tax deduction in the country where the payments to contractors or subcontractors which would include ad agencies uh, etc uh, tax is deducted at source from the payments made to the contractor so if a company for example if money life uh, takes over you know one or two more units on this floor and is is doing up the place they engage some carpenter they engage a mason and you know all the plumbers and etc and get the work done if the at the time of uh, you know recording the bill of that particular contractor money life the company will have to deduct tax at source from the the bill uh, of the raised by the contractor similarly uh, ad agencies if if a, if a company gives an ad to some uh, some ad agency the advertisement revenue uh, paid to that particular agency will attract a tds under 194c 194d insurance commission not very relevant here 194h commission and brokerage normal other commission and brokerage that attracts tds not many people are aware of this but for example uh, you know uh, again same example of money life taking the next op opposite office on rent it does the deal through a real estate agent and has to pay you know say one month's rent to that fellow as brokerage they will have to deduct tax from the commission or the brokerage paid 194i uh, is in respect of rent rent paid so when a rent is paid either for land or building or for plant and machinery again tds provisions apply 194b talks about rent from land and building and 194a talks of rent from plant and machinery the classification is there only for the purpose of chalan that while while entering the uh, figures in the tax payment chalan 194j which concerns people like me where we get professional fees or fees for technical services fees paid to an architect to a doctor to an engineer to a chartered accountant to a lawyer etc all these kind of fees will be covered under 194j and would attract a tds 194 ia which came in a few years back which affect everyone in this room because when you are buying a house uh, an immobile property other than an agricultural land at the time of buying the uh, that property if the value exceeds 50 lakhs then we as a buyer we have to deduct tax at source under 194 ia from the payment made to the seller even if it is a you know you are buying from a uh, the builder itself directly it is an under construction property yet we will have to deduct tax at source under 194 ia and uh, most of the other sections do not apply to a normal individual meaning a person who is not engaged in business but 194 ia there is no exception except for the threshold limit of 50 lakhs as a common man or a salaried person also if he is out to buy a house which is costing more than 50 lakhs this section will apply on the other hand a salaried person paying fees to me for helping him or her file a return of income that person will not have to deduct tax at source so just an example to illustrate the the differentiation between these kind of sections there are some instances where tax is not deductible so tax tds is not collected on payments made to the rbi or to the government of india uh, tds will not be collected when interest is credited or paid to a central or state financial corporation to banking company so for when companies take loans from banks and they pay interest to the bank there is no tds from that particular payment uh, interest paid by the income tax department to us if at all you know if at all you get interest from the tax department on the refund that we get uh, then on that also there is no tds except in the case of non resident so if you have a non resident relative who has filed a return who has got a refund due from that the department will definitely deduct tds under section 195 and so on and so forth like in indira vikas patra and the uh, the kisan vikas patra nsc etc et do not attract tds from a nri perspective 
the most important kind of investment is the NRE deposits. You know, so from on NRE deposits again, there is no TDS primarily because the interest itself is exempt from uh, tax. And similarly, if there are any other institution notified for the purpose of uh, exemption from the TDS provisions, how it works very broadly, the payer of the income or the money deducts the tax. It pays it or deposits uh, the money to the credit of the central government. Then that deductor has to file the quarterly TDS statements or some people call it TDS returns, but technically they are called as statements of TDS. Then the payer issues the TDS certificate to the payee and finally the payee that is we the end recipient of the income will claim credit for the TDS in the return of income that we file at our individual end. So this is broadly the process. What are the rates? Again, it is just for academic interest. Uh, the for salaries, there is no rate of tax. Unlike all other sections where there is a particular rate prescribed. The reason being that salary is always paid to an individual. And individuals are subject to the slab rates. Somebody may be in the zero rate because the income does not exceed two and a half lakhs. Somebody may be in the 10% rate when the income is between 2.5 to 5. Somebody may be in the 20% rate by when the income is between 5 and 10 and 30% if the income exceeds 10 lakhs. So depending on the taxable salary paid to a particular person, the deductor will have to calculate the, the taxable income of that employee, calculate the total tax liability on that salary income and then deduct. So it could be different for every uh, employee. Uh, interest on the uh, bank interest what you get from banks 10 percent uh, if the interest in the whole year exceeds 10,000 rupees uh, there is a whole big issue uh, relating to interest on bank FD which Mr. Datar had also pointed out I will deal with that separately so I am not getting into the details about this just now but it is very very interesting and uh, heart breaking uh, you know uh, examples lotteries and uh, puzzles uh, winning 10,000 uh, if it exceeds 10,000 then 30 percent straight away 30 percent uh, contractors is 2 percent and 1 percent depending on the you know kind of contract and whether it is a subcontractor etc but here just to to explain why our laws become complicated this is a classic example that long back the uh, the limit for contractual payments to attract TDS was 20,000 so what what was uh, what people were understanding was that if i make a contractual payment which is not exceeding 20000 then there is no need to deduct tax so so far so good then intelligent people started taking a stand that that 20000 limit applies to every contract so for example i engage a car i am an architect i engage a carpenter to do some work for all my projects so for every project I enter into a separate contract with him. Every contract is 18,000 worth. Okay, so 18,000 did not cross the 20,000 limit. Therefore, every time I made a payment to that chap for every contract, I did not deduct tax. You know, and that's how people started avoiding the TDS. Whereas that was never the intention. Though, probably the intention was that at the end of the, I mean, for the whole year, if the limit of 20,000 is crossed, then you need to deduct the tax. So, you know, to because of these kind of uh, intelligent and ingenious uh, interpretations that came into existence, they brought in a further provision that for a particular contractor, if one contract does not exceed 20,000, but if the annual payments, all the other contracts totally put together exceeds 50,000, at that time the limit was 20 and 50, then you still need to deduct the tax. So they try to curb the malpractices and thereby uh, you know avoid the uh, to, to, to bring back the tax uh, the contractor into the TDS net. Today's limit is 30,000 per contract and annual total contract uh, total total value for the same contractor is 75,000. So even if an individual contract does not exceed 30,000 if total amounts paid to that particular contractor exceed 75,000 in a year the the payer will need to deduct the tax at source. Uh, rent paid for building uh, for land and building of a plant and machinery in excess of 180,000 per annum will attract a 10% tax as far as land and building is concerned 
and as far as plant and machinery is concerned it is 2%. Now here it is uh, in again interesting because many of us may be having you know certain offices which we have given out on rent. In the past what was happening was that again a very strict interpretation was taken that rent means rent for property and it does not include rent for uh, movable asset for furniture, fixtures, you know, uh, uh, say uh, uh, the air conditioners, etc. So again, what uh, you know, intelligent people started doing, one like eighty thousand. So let us presume, suppose the rent fixed was say twelve twelve thousand per month. So one like forty four thousand. I am not twelve. Say uh, two lakh per annum for the whole year. It exceeds one like eighty thousand limit. So what they did was they broke it up and said one lakh fifty is for the for the premises and fifty thousand is for the other assets. One fifty does not exceed one eighty, so no TDS. And that's how again people started playing mischief, you know, to get out of the TDS net. So obviously, when when people try to avoid or evade taxes, the government will retaliate, and that's how we have this that rent includes rent for not only premises but also the loose assets. And therefore, now that particular issue has been covered. And therefore, now I would feel that instead of getting into all these headache of splitting, you know, splitting the uh, the rent agreement into two parts for the property for the other assets is better to have one particular uh, rental agreement. <coughs> of course, that is subject to the issue of uh, at a future date the municipal taxation going up because of the rent. But that is a different matter. From a tax perspective, it really doesn't matter. 194 IA, uh, I mentioned 50 lakhs. Professional fees, I mentioned 30,000. Attracts 10 percent. On when you buy a house exceeding 50 lakhs, you have to deduct tax at 1 percent from the uh, so every time you make an installment payment to the builder, from that amount, one person has to be deducted. Most of the builders, uh, even HDFC and all the you know the housing finance companies are now completely aware of this. When you take a loan itself or when you buy a house itself, they will give you a you know a document saying that you are supposed to deduct tax. This is how you deduct. This is how much you deduct, etc. And it is all fairly well organized now, at least with the uh, the. the the good quality uh, people in this business. What we have to re uh, remember is that all these rates which we talked about 10, 2, 1, 30, whatever it is, that is the only amount that is to be deducted. We generally have to pay a surcharge or a education cess in the normal course, but as far as TDS is concerned, those are not to be added. So for example, when you earn say 50,000 interest, the TDS will be 10 percent flat, which is 5,000 and not 10.3 or whatever it the odd figure you know. That brings us to one very drastic provision of the Income Tax Act uh, which you it would be good if you are aware of it because maybe all of, yours, uh, of us in this room have a PAN but some of our ho people back home or family members back home may not have a PAN. There is a section 206AA and that says that when a, a payment is to be made and if it is subject to TDS, meaning it results, it, or it is covered by any of the sections of TDS, then the person who is making the payment has to ensure that that other party to whom he is making the payment has a PAN. Then only all these rates will apply as per the section. If that other party does not have a PAN, then the tax to be deducted is at a higher rate of 20%. So, so in all you will see it is 10, 2, 1, etc. 2 percent. Only in this case it is 30 percent. So obviously where the rate is higher than 20 then the higher rate will apply. But otherwise instead of 1 percent, 20 percent, instead of 10 percent, 20 percent, etc, etc. So this is a problematic one. So if many people what they do is they transfer the FD from the husband name to the wife's name or to the uh, mother's you know senior citizen name and keep the FDs in their name and earn the interest in that name to split the income so that the tax liability comes down. But please remember that if that person does not have a PAN and if by chance the interest exceeds the amount uh, of the threshold then instead of deducting at 10 percent there will be a TDS of 20 percent. So you need to be careful about that. Software, I don't think it is, you know, basically anybody would be uh, uh, sort of uh, interested in this, but basic, there is a huge controversy about whether to deduct tax at source at the time of making payment for a software. Uh, 
we are not supposed to use that company having that certificate for my team. Software. <coughs> yeah, it's correct. But I think for a general uh, thing, it's not of uh, interest. Uh, as far as the due dates are concerned, so in the process flow, we saw that the deductor deducts, <coughs> then pays to the government. So when does he have to make payment to the government? If the tax is deducted in the month of April, the due date for payment to the government is 7th of May, and so on and so forth. Only in the month of March, the year end, when, when the, th the financial year ends, all the TDS which is deducted in the month of March has to be paid to the government by 30th April. There is, uh, in the process flow, there was also one uh, step that after paying the tax to the government, we have to file quarterly TDS returns or quarterly TDS statements. The due date for that is for the first quarter, April, May, June. So when this particular uh, current quarter of April to June 2016 ends, the deductors will have to file the TDS return by 31st July. For the next quarter by October, 31st October, 31st Jan, and for March by 31st May. So these are the due dates for filing the TDS return and the payments. What forms, of course, as deductees, you are not concerned with what form that person has to uh, uh, fill in at the time of payment, but just for general knowledge, for information, at the time of payment, you need to fill in ITNS 281. Uh, and make payment. The e-filing for salary TDS returns is to be done in form 24Q for all other TDS in 26Q and if you have made payment to a non-resident and deducted tax is form 27Q. The TDS certificates that we get at, as an end user, as the as person from whose money tax has been deducted are only of two types. In case of salaries it is form 16, in case of all other payments it is form 16A. Uh, Recently, or not very recently, but sometime in the last uh, couple of years, the government has uh, transferred the entire TDS uh, administration from the earlier uh, NSDL, uh, earlier supplier uh, vendor called NSDL, to its itself, and that itself is then at the back end managed by uh, Infosys. And Traces is the is, is the name of the website, Traces, and now the deductors have to mandatorily. We generate the TDS certificates from that traces website. So that has been a fantastic step because what was happening was that uh, I think I have missed. Yeah, I have missed out the due dates for filing uh, to for issuing the TDS certificate. But there is a due date for issuing the TDS certificates also. So in the past, I still remember when I was practicing earlier I, in my initial days, the TDS certificates were generally issued at the end of the year, after the end of the year. Big thappa came and the deductor used to sign and put the rubber stamp and then issue it. Now the fact of the matter is that there is a due date for issuing the TDS certificate. If you if you have to deduct on a quarterly basis, you have to make payment on a, I mean, you have to deduct on a monthly basis, make payment on a quarterly basis, file TDS returns on a quarterly basis. The certificates were also required to be issued on a quarterly basis and there was a particular time limit. But practically everyone knew, the whole world knew that it, they are all issued uh, you know, long after the due dates. And merrily the date put on the certificate is the correct date, meaning without delay. To curb that now what the brilliant uh, people in the IT department of the income tax have done is that they have made it mandatory to issue the certificate through the system. So for example, April, May, June of 2015, if my firm had deducted tax from some payment made to a, another professional and deducted tax and paid to the government, we have done everything right, but the certificate we have forgotten to issue. And if I do it today through the system, the certificate will bear today's date. So the government e easily knows that I have delayed the issue of TDS certificate and through the system itself, I will get a notice for interest payment for the delay in issuing the uh, TDS certificate. So this is something good because this will, you know, bring everybody, uh, uh, bring discipline into the uh, deductors. For companies and those who have a tax audit mandatory, for them, tax has to be paid electronically and you cannot make physical tax payments. So that is something again, uh, it's a complete sea change uh, which has happened in the last 10 years. Of course, the UPA government has brought this in. Uh, and But I would feel that it is a great move. Because now most of us have, you know, net banking. We are we are comfortable with 
uh, dealing uh, you know uh, on the banking front on the internet uh, for payment of tds on transfer of immobile property other than uh, agricultural land it's the while so as i said everyone in this room would be covered if you buy a uh, immobile property so we will get you know little scared that well, i'll have to start you know doing the tds compliance but it's not difficult in fact i think i have written one article uh, in a previous issue of money life on this that when you buy a property how to go about the tds compliance is fairly simple uh, if you are if anybody is interested we can share that article or if it is not there i'll share it with you but basically a form called 26 qb has to be filled up it is a chalan come tds return form so everything is filled up only once by the buyer of the property and then thereafter a form 16b is generated by the system itself the buyer has to download it sign it and give it to the builder or to the, the person from whom is buying the property if you fail to deduct the tax or after deducting fail to deposit the tax then what are the consequences the consequences are that there will be an interest payable at 1% per month from the date on which tax was deductible up to the date on which the tax is deducted and 1.5% per month from the date of deduction up to the date of deposit so, yeah. so this is a huge amount this, this is a massive hit for the taxpayer because when if there is a default and if this interest is to be paid this interest is not tax deductible it's not a business expense so it's a straight loss for the deductor then if you fail to furnish the tds return in time 200 per day is the penalty that one needs to pay uh, but subject to the amount of tds sometimes what used to happen was tds amount was 1000 and if you have made a default of 6 days that 6 6 into 200 1200 or more than the tds itself so they have restricted it luckily to the amount of tds penalty is also applicable if deductor fails to furnish the tds return up even after one year from the due date and the penalty is for giving incorrect details in the tds return a maximum of 1 lakh can be levied the penalty of uh, up to 1 lakh can be levied between 10000 and 1 lakh so you can imagine that while the government has outsourced the revenue collection duty of itself to others it is like you know telling forcing someone to do social work you have to do social work if you don't do if you if you don't go from 5 to 6 you have to pay this if you don't go from 2 to 3 you have to pay this that kind of stuff you know which brings me to the extremely important uh, part of understanding of how taxes are administered in the country form 26 as just for my info, how many of you have seen your form 26 as your own 26 as okay so there are a few people who have not who don't know about the either don't know about 26 as or who have not paid attention to the 26 as one spot of advice is that do not neglect this this is a bible this is a bhagavad gita this is a quran for us for tax payers now you just as when you have a bank account you are very conscious and conscientious about your bank statement or the passbook you have got to be similarly you know conf, uh, 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 sure about it similarly interested in this particular document form 26 as it's a it's a like a passbook of tax payments for every tax payer so it is linked uh, it is linked to your particular pan account so every tax payer every person who has a pan in the country has necessarily got a form 26 as it it's automatic only thing is it is up to the particular person to have a look at it government can't force you to have a look at it so they have made it available online one has to log into the e filing portal of the government uh, of the income tax department and download that particular form 26 as <coughs> what does it contain it contains the details of tds deducted from income paid to you by others it can it has the details of tax collected by uh, under the tcs system it has details of the advance tax paid by you if at all it has the details of self assessment tax paid by you at the time of filing the return <coughs> it has the details of regular assessment tax which you may have paid after your assessment gets over and some demand is raised by the department it also if a refund is due to you then it has the details of the refund if interest is paid to you in the case of nris then that interest uh, uh, plus the tds from the interest all those details are given in the 26 as 
Then there are also details of high value transactions in respect of shares, mutual funds, etc. So these are all contained in the form 26 AS. The why it is important? Oh, this was what it contained, what is contained in the 26 years, but why am I saying that it is important for you to pay attention to it? The reason is that the government gives credit for tax to you as a taxpayer only if that amount is reflected in the 26 years. If it is not there in 26 years, you can, you can do what you want. You know, you can go and meet the Prime Minister in his monkey bar, but you will not get credit. Simple. Because everything is system driven. System doesn't listen to a good minister or a bad minister. System is configured to reject a claim for tax payment if that tax payment does not match with the form 26 years period. So therefore the credit is given based on 26 years. The organization which is deducting the TDS from your income will issue a TDS certificate to you after filing the TDS return. You can compare the form 26 years with the TDS certificate. So we all get TDS certificates hopefully. When we get the certificate, please ensure that it matches with the information given in the form which is appearing in your form 26 years. And if there is a, uh, if, if, if the amount of TDS as per 26 years and the TDS certificate match, then it means that the credit reflecting in your form 26 years is correct. However, if the two don't match, if the amount in TDS certificate and the 26 years is there is a mismatch, then you, you need to definitely run to the tax deductor and point out the problem and ensure that that fellow rectifies the mistake what which he may have made in the TDS return that he has filed. Now, some of the common reasons why there is a mismatch. One could be that that person has not paid the tax to the government. First, he deducted but he has not paid to the government. So then where is the question of him giving you a TDS certificate, filing the return etc. Or second possibility is that he has paid the tax to the government but has not filed the TDS return and that is why it is not shown against your name. Third could be that he has done everything right, he has deducted the tax, paid the tax, filed the TDS return but instead of putting your PAN, he has put somebody else's PAN, you know, by mistake. There are various reasons why there could be a mismatch between the 26 AS and the TDS certificates. But uh, yeah, so in incorrect uh, PAN etc or not quoted the PAN etc, those could be the issues. Uh, so after you go back to the deductor and point out the mistake, hopefully he will revise the return, the TDS return and then once the TDS return is revised uh, by the deductor after making necessary correction, then the credit will get reflected in your form 26 years after a, a gap of some time. Therefore, it is extremely important for all of us to, uh, to keep in mind the fact that before you file your return, before you file your return, please ensure that tax as appearing in 26 AS matches with what you are claiming in your return. If you don't do that, see in the olden days it was okay because we all know that after filing the return for two years we then never heard from the department. Now everything is done on the system and some of you may have had this pleasant experience last year when we filed the returns for the year ended 31st March 2015 that the returns were filed in July and in August people started getting the refunds into their bank account. The reason was that the central processing center at Bangalore which processes the e-file returns was given direction that this year you have to be extremely prompt and quickly issue the refunds. So within a few days of filing the return they started processing the returns and by processing what do we mean? Processing is that they match the tax payments in the return with the 26 years. If it matches everything is fine. If you have a refund due to the taxpayer, give the refund to him. So now we are in a situation, we are living in times where at least the processing which is done electronically is done very fast and therefore the moment you file the return, within a few days they will process it. At that point of time, if the, there is a mismatch between the information in the return and the information in the 26 AS, then you are in trouble because they will then not give you credit for that particular tax. So this is bold, underlined and you know, double font size. The TDS certificates are being downloaded from Traces portal, I mentioned this earlier. Therefore, now the chances of mismatch between the TDS certificate and 26 AS are very remote because the TDS certificates that get downloaded from the TDS, uh, uh, from the Traces portal are 
generated only after the TDS returns get filed properly by the uh, tax deductor. So, chances of mismatch are very, very less now, but sometimes they do happen. Uh, so, it sometimes it so happens that the amount of TDS credit appearing in 26 AS is more than the amount in the TDS certificates. And this happens because one or some of the deduct deductors who have issued TDS on their have not issued the certificate. This is the possibility that you have not got the certificate, but tax has been deducted, it is appearing in your 26 AS. So, your focus should now move from TDS certificates to 26 AS. If, even if you do not get TDS certificate, do not worry too much as long as the credit appears in your form 26 AS. Uh, okay. Unclaimed TDS credit brought forward. So, uh, you know, we were, uh, I was referring earlier to Mr. Data when we were talking before this that sometimes what happens is that there is a I am a chartered accountant to, to illustrate how these mismatches happen that I am a chartered accountant. Most professionals like chartered accountants follow a cash system of accounting meaning when we get our fees we treat it as income, when we make a payment to somebody for expenses we treat it as expense. It is not on accrual. So for example uh, the electricity bill of March 2016 it comes in April we pay it in April. So, even though it pertains to last year, we will treat it as expense of the current year when because we have paid it in April. Similarly, if I have raised an invoice on a client in March, but I get the fees in April or May, then it will be income of that subsequent year. So, a cash system of accounting, what happens is that the income is accounted for in, a, in year 2 and not in year 1. But the person who has received my bill in the past, before March, he will deduct tax in March itself because he has to, as I told you earlier, deduction is at the time of credit in the books or payment whichever is earlier. So, obviously, he will treat it as his last year's expense. He will account for it in last year. So, he has to deduct at that time. So, when he files the TDS return for last year, last quarter of last year, he will show that TDS against my PAN. So, in my 26 years, that TDS will come for March 16. But I have got the, in, I mean, I am going to offer that income for tax in March 17, year ended March 17. So, there is a mismatch between my uh, return of income for financial year 15 16 as compared to my 26 AS for 15 16. And similarly, there will be a mismatch when I file my next year's return because the TDS is not appearing in my that year's form 26 AS. So, there are all these kind of issues, and therefore, there is a concept of brought forward unmatched TDS credit. When does the situation occur? TDS is deducted on advance payment, deductor follows mercantile method while deductive follows cash system. I give you that, that example. Uh, I also give you the reason. Now, what to do in this kind of situation? So, in the ITR form, there is a particular schedule called schedule TDS and it has two columns, unclaimed TDS brought forward where you have to give the details of the earlier years financial the earlier financial year the, the year and the amount and the unclaimed tds which is carried forward to the subsequent year both the possibilities are there that you have brought forward some credit from earlier year and in the current year there is a tds which you are carrying forward to the subsequent year so this this was missing for years together which was brought in i think last year or, or the earlier year and this to some extent is a great relief for the people like me wherever these mismatch, mismatches happen you know. So, the, you have to fill in the form uh, uh, in the ITR form you have to fill up the figures properly. So, for example, a client of mine has deducted say 10,000 rupees in March 2016 when I am but I am not go I, so in my 26 years the TDS will appear of 10,000. I have shown that income in the subsequent year. So, when I am filing my return for March 16, I will show that 10,000 as TDS. Then I will say the amount that I am. So, if you look at this, amount out of 6 or 7 being carried forward. So, I will say TDS 10,000, amount claimed in the current year 0, and therefore amount carried forward to subsequent year 10,000. Or in the reverse situation where I am bringing forward something from last year. So, in March 16 TDS is there which I am going to offer for tax in subsequent year. So, 16, 17 when I file the return, I will say last year's TDS 10,000, amount claimed this year 10,000 and therefore now balance 
carried forward is zero. So this is the way they have they have tried to resolve the problem of mismatch of the TDS. Then we come to a very popular topic, 15G and 15H. Where you know Mr. Datta also raised this point, and I answered you know in my usual uh, jocular manner to Sucheta, and she forwarded it to Amitabh Kant and uh, uh, the Revenue Secretary. Now, if at all they happen to meet me, I've had it. But anyway, 15G and 15H. First, we need to understand the difference between two because even among chartered accountants, if you ask many times, you don't know the difference. The, you ask whether I should fill G or H, many people don't know the difference. That's why I have devoted a slide to it. First of all, both these forms, whether G or H, can be filled only by individuals. So, you, if you are a company, you can't give this uh, form. If you are a partnership form, you can't give this form. 15G can be, uh, let's look at 15H first. 15H can be, has to be filled up by a senior citizen. Senior citizen is someone who has, I, who has completed the age of 60 anytime during the year or who will complete the age of 60 during the particular year. So, if you are talking about the current year, for example, financial year 16-17, if someone is as of just now aged 59 years, but the birthday will come in say March 2017. So, somewhere during the year that person will cross the age of 60 and will therefore qualify to be a senior citizen for the whole year. So, that person will have to file form 15H. So, if you are a resident Indian and you are a senior citizen during the year, then you have to fill up form 15. But form 15 can be filled up only if the tax calculated on your total income is nil. So, why the thrust is on total income is that many common man does not have the, uh, the, the, the does not give the importance to the term total income because for that person he does not know what is total income. Total income is the income as calculated under the income tax act. So, what is the difference? For example, you have a salary income of say 4 lakhs. You have put in money in your PPF, in your uh, company PF, in your LIC in premium, etc., in the equity link saving schemes, all that kind of stuff, MediClaim premium, etc., and you have all these deductions that you are entitled to. So, 1 lakh 50,000 is the upper limit for the ATC deduction for PPF, etc., and another say 15,000 for the MediClaim. So, you have a 1 lakh 65, you have put all these monies into the respective uh, places, and you are entitled to 1 lakh 65 deduction. So, from 4 lakhs of salary, you deduct 165. So, your total income is 2,35. When you are talking in a layman's term, your income is 4 lakhs. But for tax purposes, the total income is 2,35. So, when <coughs> the tax on that 2,35 or whatever is that income, whatever is that figure, if it is nil, then only you can file the 15 edge. And this is where the whole problem lies. Most people do not know that the, you know you are not supposed to be giving 15H in the first place, but they have been merrily giving away the 15H because and typically what happens is that for senior citizens especially when they go to the bank and that clerk sitting there sees a senior citizen walking in with a walking stick, the first thing he will say is uncle up 15H they do, you know, he is not even asking that person whether he wants to give or not, whether he is allowed to give or not. This has actually happened in my own family members case, so I am talking with confidence. This is, they sometimes force that person to give the 15 edge. I do not know why they do that. But anyway, if you are a senior citizen, if that income does not, total income, taxable income as calculated under the Income Tax Act does not exceed the threshold limit, then you are entitled to give the form 15 edge. Keep that in mind. Uh, uh, that brings us to 15 G. 15G again can be given as I said by only indi by individual uh, or HUF who is a resident Indian and who is not a senior citizen, so non-senior citizens and if the tax calculated on your total income is nil, so so far this is similar to 15H, but this is where the problem is, the last uh, condition which is causing the problem which you also referred to, the total interest income for the year should be less than the basic exemption limit of that year. So, in the same example that I gave 4 lakh salary and 1 lakh 65 deduction, instead of that let us take 4 lakh bank interest, no other income. Interest on FD 4 lakhs, 1 lakh 65 is the deduction that you are going to claim, 150 for your PPF or whatever it is and 15,000 for uh, medical. Your income is 2 lakh 35. 
had you been in this situation you could have given here yeah. so far you are satisfying the conditions problem is here problem is that your interest income is 4 lakhs which is more than the threshold limit you cannot give form 15 g and lastly nris are not allowed to give because if you see it is resident indian resident indian so nri relatives of yours there is no question of giving form 15 g or 15 h as the case may be now what is it that we need to keep in mind while thinking about or talking about 15 g and h uh, just tell me where i'm running about. you first of all you have to ensure that you submit your pan details to the bank while submitting the form 15 g and h now for for various I don't, for, for reasons that i can't understand in the form 15 g and h they ask you i don't know how many of you ever bothered to fill up and i wonder that if you have not then who has filled up that assessing officer details where, where were you assessed for the last year last year which was the year for which you were last assessed i don't know how many of us are actually aware where we are assessed you know first of all and which was the last assessment order uh, year for which you got the order those are the details that you need to fill up most of the time the banks take blank forms from you without those items filled in and i don't know how they go about you know accepting those things but anyway at least ensure that the pan is filled up properly in the in the form uh, i've talked about the consequences of not giving the pan that higher tds rate of 20 percent then third important point please keep in mind is when you give the form to the bank sometimes what happens is we take one copy go there and give it and that fellow are ah, okay and we go back please take the acknowledgement and ideally take a photocopy of the form and take the acknowledgement on that and keep that copy with you because at a future date you may need that 15 you one doesn't know when you will need it so keep that with you uh, try and give at the beginning of the year your banker will also be after you you know the moment first april comes the bankers run after you give your 15 g 15 h whatever it is because if any interest is due to you in the month of april and you have not yet given the form then they will be forced to deduct the tax because they they cannot not deduct unless you have given form 15 g or h so this is something that we need to keep in mind uh, in case the bank deducts the tax in spite of the fact that you have submitted the form or <coughs> before you actually submit the same please remember bank is not going to give you back the tds unless you are really really friendly with that bank manager and he's somehow you know adjust that tds against some other fellow and all that but practically uh, i mean theoretically that cannot happen <clears throat> practically you may be able to manage somehow or the other and which is one reason why we have the public sector mess uh, bank mess that we have at present you know. so therefore the only option available for you in that case would be to file your tax return and claim that tds in your return and claim the refund from the government every form that you give 15g or h is valid only for one year that is why you are aware that every year you need to give it you know uh, if you want to apply for nil tds in the new financial year you will have to again submit the form the in the next year this is where most people go wrong so 15g and h are meant to prevent tds and not to avoid tax payment so it's a facility provided to those people in whose case tax is not payable to allow the deductor to not deduct the tax and make the payment to that person without TDS so that the deductee is not put to hardship because of the TDS and unnecessarily does not have to claim the refund of tax. It is not a mechanism given to you to try and avoid the tax payment. You know, it is only a way of avoiding unnecessary deduction of tax when you are not supposed to pay the tax. You will be required to file a tax return if your total income before the deduction is above the tax exemption limit. This is, a, I, of course, this is nothing to do with TDS, but this is again a huge uh, misconception in the mind of the common man that if my income does not exceed threshold limit, I don't need to file the return. It's not that. In the same example that I give you, four lakh income, one lakh sixty-five deductions, two lakh thirty-five the final income below threshold limit. That does not mean that you don't have to file the return. You still need to file the return because the exemption or the exclusion for from filing the return is only if your gross income before deductions is below the threshold limit. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, now this is where the fun begins for the current year. The forms have undergone a change this year. You know the 15 G and H. 
and in the new forms we have to give so when suppose i have a fixed deposit with hdfc bank and i have another fixed deposit with say canara bank when i go to give form 15g to the uh, hdfc bank in the form i have to give details of and this was not the case last year but this year i have to give the details of the fd kept with canara bank also that detail has to be filled in the form which i give to hdfc and vice versa when i give to canara i have to give the details of the deposit with the hdfc bank so every 15g or every 15h that you give we have to give details of the all the fixed deposits kept and most of the banks themselves don't know what is the actual position you know that what what are the details to be filled up you know and so there is one column where you have to give the 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 total income for this year the total uh, which is how much you are likely to earn in the year so there is at one place where i went the banker insisted that after adding all the interest of all the banks put together that total should not exceed 2 and 1/2 lakhs which is the threshold limit i started arguing with the banker and then finally that manager agreed that okay you put up to 3 and 1/2 lakhs because you are going to get 1 lakh deduction under chapter 80 under section 80c so that banker agreed for 3 and 1/2 lakhs somewhere else he refusing no it has to be only 2 and 1/2 lakhs so the bankers themselves are not very clear about what is the correct position uh the interest then the other problem that we have not not to do with 15g or h but at the time of filing the return and uh, trying to match the tds is that interest which you get from the bank on fds on savings account it is okay because you actually get it into your bank it will there is no question of mismatch but uh, interest on fd there are three types of figures that you can get one is what you actually get into your bank account what is credited into your bank account during the year second is many banks if you ask for they will give you a interest certificate so on their letter it they will print your name and say that during the year we have this much is the interest which we have paid to you or which accrues to you so that is the second figure of interest and the third is what comes in your 26 as and chances are very high 99.9% that all three are different figures you know there are various reasons for that for lack of time we cannot get into that but the point the question that you will ask is that i mean you are talking of theory practically what you do which interest figure to take now mr data referred to a particular case where the ca told that person that forget everything you go by the 26 as and take the figure appearing in form 26 as now uh, i would also like to take that stand don't theoretically it may not be correct but at the end of it practically what you do so the way i look at it is that even in my own case when i try to match the tds it never matches every time and luckily i don't take the interest certificate so i don't have a problem of three mismatches i i go by 26 as i go by what has come into my bank account one option which i myself have now started doing which may not be to your liking but is for me it works fantastic is that i always keep my fixed deposit start a fixed deposit on 1st april of every year and i keep it only for 363 days every year i get lower interest because obviously you know the rate of interest will be lower but i ensure that on 29th march 30th march whatever it is the money gets credited back into my bank account on 1st april again i put the fd so the problem of interest accrued on the uh, on the fd never arises there is never a mismatch in my case as far as tds and interest both are concerned because that interest will come into my bank account on 28th march when the fd matures on 31st march there is no outstanding fd so no interest accrued all the headaches are not there first april again i put the bag i lose out that one or half a percent of 0.75% of interest because the rate is lower but i am saved the trouble of wasting my time on trying to match everything so this is one very simplistic option may not appeal to everyone the other option therefore is that which figure do you take how how to you know how to resolve the issue taking the form 26 as figure is the simplest op- option because then you don't have a headache you, it the the system that is going to process your tax return at the cpc end will match the two if it matches you 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 sail through so mr datar i would say that the advice given by the ca is a practical advice i'm not defending my fraternity but unfortunately that that seems to be the only uh, 
way out you know the reasons the main reason why these problems arise is that the banks have to follow an accrual system of accounting now accrual can be interpreted in two ways quarterly june april to june july to september so 30th june 30th september 31st december 31st march they will pass entries in their books for the cumulative in, uh, uh, interest that is accumulated deduct tax and pay to the government but because your fd is kept for you have kept it on a growth cumulative basis you are not going to get that money it is only their accounting entry so they pass the entry they pay the tax matter is over but you will get it next year or after two years or three years whatever when you when the fd matures that is in case of cumulative fds even if it is not cumulative and say the interest payouts are half yearly or quarterly or whatever it is there will still be a mismatch if you have kept the fd at a odd date somewhere during the year then on 31st march you may not get the interest you will get on say 7th april 7th may whatever it is so in this kind of situation there are going and 101% there will be a mismatch the only way to resolve it is that take as per 26 as and then sleep and if for your case comes up for scrutiny you take the stand that at the end of it look at by 3 year period gross interest i have got so much for the fd of 10 lakhs over the 3 year period i have shown this much in year 1 this much in year 2 this much in year 3 total amount tallies with the total interest total tds tallies with the total tds i have not done any hanky panky this i am sure i mean if i have get if anyone comes to me as a client i will defend you this is the way practically you can get out of this particular issue of the uh, mismatches but again coming back to 15g 15h there is an issue because in now the stupidity is that they want you to give the fdr numbers in the form itself and how much interest you are going to get so you have to calculate the interest and put that figure but the problem is not that the problem is the when you are giving on 3rd april 1st april whatever it is you may have three fds what happens if you put a new fd during the year then that means that again you have to fill up a new form 15g or 15h put the new de details in of the new fd in that and again submit it to the uh, banker i would have felt that it makes more sense that at the beginning of the year i anticipate what will be my total interest just put a lump sum amount without giving the details and give it to the bank and as long as the interest does not exceed that figure bank is can happily accept that and not deduct tax that was a happy situation but now it has become complicated coming to some of the popular misconceptions uh, so as i referred earlier you know let's understand the basics of income tax some people say that bank has deducted tax from my interest and therefore i don't have to pay any more tax nothing can be further from the truth the reason is that we as individuals as i said earlier attract tax on a slab rate depending on which slab 10% 20% 30% now if i am in the top slab my total income is more than 10 lakhs then i have to pay tax at 30% on the amount which exceeds 10 lakhs between 5 and 10 whatever is the income so on 5 lakhs i have to pay 20% but presuming that i have for example 11 lakhs of fd interest and no other income okay my bank will deduct 10% on 11 lakhs so 1 lakh 10000 would have been deducted totally i can't take a stand that because tds has been deducted by the bank i don't have to pay any more tax because my liability is not 1 lakh 10 my liability will be much more than that on 5 lakh itself 20% is 1 lakh on 1 lakh above 10 lakhs it is 30 so 30000 so 1 lakh 30 it is just there 2 and a half to 5 lakhs 10% is another 25 so my liability is much more than the tds that the bank has deducted i will therefore have to pay the tax so this is a wrong understanding or a misunderstanding in the uh, minds of a lot of people then my income comes to me after tds so i don't need to file my return again absolutely uh, wrong interpretation my employer deducts tax from my salary and i don't have any other income so i don't need to file my return we have get lot of salary people who come to us saying and they say this especially to negotiate the fees saying that my case is very simple i get only salary income i have no other income now we as i the i ask him do you get cash salary and keep only at home or do you put it in your bank if you put in your bank obviously you will get interest income that is taxable so where is the question of you saying i don't have any other income you know you have claimed atc for in, uh, by investing in national saving certificate what happens to the interest on that no. so this is another popular misconception last i have given form 15g or h to the bank therefore i don't have to pay tax 
again that is not the correct position 15 G and H may have been given by mistake or you know even correctly but that does not necessarily mean that you do not have to pay tax or you do not have to uh, uh, file the tax return. Coming to the end, uh, we need to be very, very careful. Uncle Sam, uh, the income tax department, the government of India is watching us. Everything is digital. Now, our, our prime minister is digital. Our ministers are becoming digital. They are all online. Most of the stuff is online. Everything that you do in the world today, in, in, in the country today, is pan based. You go to buy something, you have to give a pan. You may be aware that in the budget there was a provision that when you buy certain goods also, above I think 1 lakh or 2 lakh, the pan has to be quoted over there. So everything is pan based. Your pan, so you invest in mutual funds, you have to give a pan. You invest in FD, you have to give a pan. Everything is pan based. Therefore, the government is, and based on that pan, lot of agencies have to report huge amounts of information to the income tax department. They are getting not MBs, not GBs, but TBs in terms, in terms of data size on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis from various sources. And there is a full-fledged full -fledged department sitting in Bangalore in the income tax department which is analyzing the data. Their job is only to analyze the data. And I have first-hand information about this because my firm is helping them in this analysis of the data because we have a data analytics team. They are analyzing this data, they have, so some example we have got is that some people have been depositing cash across the country, across branches of different banks, running into crores and crores and they don't have a pan. You know, this kind of thing are happening in the country, but the government is aware of this. The tax department is aware of this and now they are working on a plan of how to go after all these people. You know. But it's still, it's still happening. It's still happening. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So, so these kind of things have been happening. The, the data, uh, the the particular department of the income tax uh, department is analyzing this data very, very carefully, and the AIR report that I mentioned, the annual information reports, which mutual funds have to submit, credit card companies have to submit, banks have to submit, I companies which come out with IPOs have to submit. Stock exchange, the bro bro through the stock exchange, the brokers have to submit. All these agencies have to report the AIRs to the income tax department. Again, in in that AIR, everything is pan based. So, if I buy shares, tax department knows. If I buy mutual fund, he knows. They know. If I spend credit card more than two lakhs, they know. If I buy a car exceeding a particular amount, they will know. Everything is available to them. Don't be under the impression that you can get away with anything is very very difficult now at least they are aware of it now whether they take action on it that's a different matter but they are aware of this so the AIR the AIR reports are matched with your return of income all this is happening electronically so when when you report interest income in your uh, ITR it is matched with electronically with the AIR filed by the bank if you show cap capital gains from mutual fund, they will try to match it with the AIR filed by the mutual fund to see whether the transactions match. The 26 AS is also, as I said earlier, also it is matched with your return of income. All this is happening electronically. So it's not merely about tax; it is also about the income that you show in the return of income. So one needs to be extremely careful about whether you show or don't show. Whatever you decide, be careful, be aware that. It's very, very different world that we are living in today. Just a last thought because many times we have come across people who are cursing the other person for deducting the tax, you know, that that guy has deducted and as if he has made, you know, done a crime. I'm, I'm not, I'm not defending anyone, but I'm just trying to see for a moment, put yourself across the table in the deductor shoes. Why are they so conservative, you know? so very very uh, lightly uh, I mean informally speaking if someone comes to me for advice on TDS and if I have a doubt whether whether to deduct or not my advice will be deduct if I have a doubt about which section to apply which rate to apply if I have a doubt I will say you take the highest rate that will be my advice now if a CA is advising like that that guy is obviously going to take that particular stand so why are they why are we why are the deductors taking a conservative stand the reason is that if there is a default of TDS, 
the entire expense gets disallowed in their hands. So if a company makes a payment of professional fees to someone like me and forgets to deduct tax, that fees will not be allowed as an expense to that company. Not only that, the company will have to pay interest for the TDS default. Then it, it will have to pay penalty. And lastly, there could be prosecution against that deductor. So when these kind of consequences are there, which person in his right mind will be very casual about it? Of course, he will be conservative. Of course, he will be extra careful about the TDS provisions. And therefore, when you are about to curse someone for deducting tax, think of these things that that person will face if he or she or it does not deduct the tax properly. Uh, yeah, so this is one thing. So if you are a deductor, finally, I would say that deduct and remit without failure, avoid interest, penalty, prosecution and disallowance with due care, file the TDS returns and issue the forms within the time. Then there is a possibility that the deductor and the deductee <laughs> will experience it. <laughs> Thank you so much. How, how am I affected when my bank has accepted my 15H form without disclosing what FDs I have in other banks? So, the responsibility of giving the 15G or 15H is on the person who signs the form, you, in your case. So, even if, for, just to, to illustrate this, you know, better, when you file your return of income, correct? When you are filing the return of income, your CA or whoever it is who is doing it for you makes you sign somewhere, correct? You are signing that return. Have you read over there what is written? Where, where the place where you are signing, there is a verification, it is called a verification. I, I cert, it is virtually a certificate that you are giving that whatever is stated in this is true and correct, okay? That is why you have these provisions of Prosecution. Why do people get prosecuted? Because they have given false information. Now, coming back to your question, 15G, 15H, that the bank has accepted without some fields being filled up or without details being filled up. At the end of it, please understand that you are responsible. It is your responsibility to fill it up properly, correctly, accurately and give it to the bank. If the bank accepts it, Okay, and on that basis, therefore, does not deduct or whatever it is, whatever it is, what is whatever it is that they do, based on their negligence, that is their problem. And you know the problem that if they if they are not deducted, what are the consequences? If they are caught, obviously, if they are caught. From your perspective, what will happen is that, so at the end of the year, when you calculate your tax, uh, your income first, and then you calculate your tax, you will realize. Suppose the case happens that your income above goes above threshold limit, you are supposed to pay tax which would have got deducted by the bank but which has not got deducted because you gave the form and therefore now you need to pay the tax. Then the problem will be that because you have not paid advance tax which you were supposed to pay if TDS was not there, you will have to pay interest for non-payment of advance tax. So those are the consequences that might arise in your case. So the precise fact is that I have made I have been made to sign the form without filling it. The bank accepts it. I take a copy of that. How am I safeguarded? No. So uh, that again, as I mentioned earlier, I am responsible. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. Most you, your bank gave you a blank. I mean, rather made you sign a blank form. Other banks, more sophisticated ones, HDFC, for example. I am not taking name just for this. My personal example, HDFC bank insisted on not getting a hand filled form, they, f they printed it from their system with all the details yes. and gave it to my mother-in-law and she signed it and gave it, you know, so it's there and in the middle are some banks where you have to fill it yourself and give it to them and then they will argue two and a half lakhs, three and a half lakhs, you spend some time over there and you know, come back. There are different kinds of bank but bottom line according to me is you have to fill it up properly. Even if they force you, I mean, if they force you to give a blank form, please change your bank. You know, most public sector banks are are, are sort of HDFC bank itself. Uh, so HDFC, ICICI, and public sector banks put on one yes, side yes, and yes, then yes. go to the other banks. You know. Sorry. Sir, post office they are not regular thank you, in thank you. in uh, in this. Uh, Understood. Yeah. Thank you. Post offices across the country have this 
feeling that they are above the law they don't deduct either they don't deduct or they deduct but they don't they don't pay they don't give the certificate you go and fight there they will say no we don't know we we you, you do what you want That's right. the complaints they don't even even ptc case doesn't show absolutely it. i agree formal complaints have gone nothing has happened up till now but now we are planning to lodge a complaint on the pg portal the public grievance portal which the prime minister has made available and hopefully because of that the action will be taken not only uh, post offices sir the, the problem income tax department asked that money eds is already deducted by post office but it is not deposited or not shown in their tcs income tax department by assessing naturally it is a system based absolutely so they will, and not only that they will charge penalty also that Correct. So there is a double double whammy for us. Excellent. Agree. Agree. The problem is there. Solution is not there as of now. There is no solution. I have purchased a flat under construction. Uh, started in uh, 2012 or so, and I think in June 2013 the TDS process started. 14. Uh, 14. I think 14. Okay. And this uh, completion was uh, October 2013. Sorry, you deducted tax and not paid to the government. Yes. Okay. Now this total amount of tax deducted but not paid is something like around thirty thirty five thousand. So I would like to pay, it, no doubt. But uh, the penalty will be maximum thirty five thirty thousand. Around. No, it won't be that. It won't be that. It depends on when you deduct it. No? So suppose you deduct in two thousand fifteen. Then I told you that one percent per month would be the amount on if whatever is the TDS. Okay. Depends. But my sincere advice is get it done tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. As soon as possible. Sir, how many societies are there? Which one TDS cutne? Not only TDS cutne ka hai, return bhi bharna hai. Return bhi bharna hai. Yes. 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 तो so, अगर आप फॉर एग्जांपल नहीं वो तो इवन मेरी खुद की सोसाइटी नहीं कर रही है माय सेक्रेटरी में हाउसिंग सोसाइटी अपना ये क्या बोलता है लिफ्ट लिफ्ट मेंटेनेंस का कॉन्ट्रैक्ट देती है uh, वो सिक्योरिटी गार्ड्स जनरली नाव डेज वो यू नो एजेंसी के थ्रू वो हायर करते हैं थर्टी थाउजेंड के ऊपर होगा कॉन्ट्रैक्ट फाइव लैक्स तो डेफिनेटली टी डी हंड्रेड परसेंट क्या हाँ नहीं 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 हुआ है वो अलग बात बट आप इफ द क्वेश्चन इज इज देर अ नीड टू कट यस आंसर इज यस एंड बट द बिगर प्रॉब्लम टैक्स नहीं काटा वो एक बात है बट रिटर्न तो कोई नहीं करता है रिटर्न फाइलिंग आई डोंट नो विच सोसाइटी इज फाइलिंग रिटर्न मे बी वो कफपरेड वाली यू नो जॉली भवन ऑल दो बिग वंस निर्मल एंड ऑल दो मे बी फाइलिंग 99.9 percent of the societies, housing societies in the city, in the country, will not be filing return. They all should be filing the return. Sir, sir, in, sorry, ek, ek, the, I'll tell you the reason why. Housing societies, as such, you know, they are entitled to a, what is a deduction called 80 section 80 P, capital P. So, what, jo income collect karte hai. they get a deduction of the same amount so income is zero but i told you earlier return filing is mandatory if the income before deductions is above threshold limit so agar interest income uh, maintenance charge whatever collection kiya hai or uh, terrace ke upar uh, tower lagaya and reliance paid 3 lakhs airtel paid 1 lakh etc society ko bahut maza aata hai secretary thinks usne teer mar liya you know when he gets that income All that income, if total above two and a half lakhs, even if finally tax is not payable, return is mandatory. Yeah. Sir, so, the does it make sense? I am in the tax bracket, say, uh, and my parents are not in the tax bracket. So does it may, uh, make sense transferring some of the FDs which I am holding in the name of my parents during the course of the year? I mean, this is a it's recorded, so. <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards. But you can give. <laughs> so uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I can't say whether it makes sense or not. What is happening? I'll tell you. In the Income Tax Act, there is a provision that 
if i get a gift i as a person get a gift from a somebody else i get a gift from him that and he gives me suppose 1 lakh rupees as a gift if he is my relative then that 1 lakh is not my income if he is not a my if he is not my relative then because that 1 lakh i mean that gifted amount is more than 50000 in the year that whole amount is my income okay so in short when a relative gives a gift to an when a person gives a gift to his relative irrespective of the amount involved that entire amount is not taxable in the hands of the recipient in the hands of the giver obviously there is no pay, you don't pay tax at the time of giving there is no so there is no gift tax and there is no income tax on the gift that you receive this is in respect of relatives so you can to your wife to your father mother uh, husband child whatever it is any relative you can give a gift no problem or you can give a loan and say that i have given a friendly loan to my family member no interest i am going to charge there is no problem as long as you have not borrowed at interest if you have borrowed uh, from a uh, bank you are paying interest to that bank and you give a loan uh, you know to your wife and don't charge interest then there could be a problem but otherwise these things are possible i leave it to you now and the income on that yeah. so if you give a if you give a loan to a relative the interest income on that loan is that person's because then that person can do what the, he or she wants if he puts in a bank fd the interest will be in that person's name yeah but gift there is a problem so gift what happens if you give a gift to your your spouse you know then there is a problem and this most people are not aware uh, suppose i give a gift of 1 lakh to my wife and my wife puts that money in a bank deposit and gets say 8000 rupees per year as interest then that 8000 income is clubbed with my income i am supposed to pay tax on it now look at the complication as far as bank is concerned the pan is of my wife interest goes into her account if they have deducted 8000 they will not deduct but suppose it is 80000 i have given you know 80 lakhs to my wife as gift she puts it in fd she gets 10% 80000 uh, 8 lakhs 80000 okay they will deduct tax 8000 that will go in her pan but income is mine i mean it will be clubbed in my hand i will have to show it in my return i can't claim the tds those are the complications Uh, in loan there is no problem but in gift for as far as spouse is concerned as far as minor children are concerned clubbing provisions will apply that's what you want yes so whether pension paid by employer pension paid by insurance company by other some scheme or pension paid by uh, mutual fund that they would affect tds uh as far so there are different ways of giving pension sometimes you get it through the the fund you know employees pension fund so there it is there is no tds unless the certain conditions are violated as far as mutual funds are concerned they are not deducting as far as employer is concerned if employer is paying himself on a on an ongoing basis and if it is exceeding a particular amount then i would suppose that he will treated as salary because it even in your hand it will be treated as salary income you know so it there would be a tax there are two questions yes yeah. yes sir please call us yes yes yeah yes sir suppose if an act was made uh, in the past uh, and it was deducted uh, however the total income of that person was less than the threshold limit uh, but the bank has deducted tds and no refund has been claimed uh, Will form 26 years reflect to the past credits. So form 26 years is year wise. Okay. Every year there is a separate 26 years. So moment there is a deduction for a particular year, it gets reflected in that year's 26 years. So if the bank has deducted, say for example in your case, say 2014-15, there was a TDS. It will go into your 26 years of financial year 14-15. If you have forgotten to file the return, for example. 1415 is a wrong example because you can still file the return uh, say 1314 financial year 1314 tds was there you did not file the return you did not claim the refund it is still lying in your 26 years it's gone forever because it has become time barred 
unless if the if the year has not become time barred you can still file the return and claim the refund but otherwise it's gone you can't say i'll claim it in next year because tds credit you will get only if you have shown that the income against that tds in that year you can't show income in year 1 and claim tds in year 2 or vice versa you can't do that No, so if you have to give the form to someone. No, so if you are giving to your bank, obviously you can't fill in your uh, fees amount or anything like that. No, you have to fill only interest amount. So it will be therefore, in short, forget section. It will be payer wise, the deductor wise. So in same example, for example, uh, interest. You have interest from HDFC Bank, Canara Bank, uh, Shamra Vital Cooperative Bank. All three you have to give different forms. So similarly, if you are getting income from uh say professional fees from somebody and you don't want him to cut tax you will give the form separately to that person that would not include the one whatever the interest or it will not include the amount which you give to the bank right so in the new format uh, new form i think yes they are asking how many forms you are how many forms yeah 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 so is that kind of absolutely field? right he is how right many so there there is a field over there how many number of such forms you have issued to others and what is the income uh, the aggregate income shown in those uh, other forms so you have to give the, you may not have to give details but total um, amount and number you have to give yeah Reserve Bank. I don't think they will deduct tax. First of all, on bonds there is no TDS. No, there is. When you take every every half yearly, when you take in the non-cumulative, they cut the TDS and they take. Are you sure? Because according to me, on bonds there is no TDS. But if they are listed, if they are listed bonds or debentures, there is no TDS. Yes. Oh, relief. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll have to check. I'm not too sure about this. Sir, sir, in that example you gave just now, just uh, because uh, my parents got a income tax notice just because they did not fill the that uh, 15 uh, 15 fifteen age form. Yeah. You can't have notice because you did not give fifteen. Because normally they file the. Uh, Huh. Oh. Huh. That particular did not file. Just because that uh, income got reported in that 26A, yes, uh, they got. Uh, I I could then do a separate <laughs> correspondence with the income tax and all. Because they normally they they don't file the income tax returns. But just because that particular they did not file that uh, maybe that they didn't dismiss it. They uh, got reported in that. I I don't agree. It's not like that. See, again to go to the basics. are you supposed to file the return or you are not supposed to that is a matter of legal thing Correct. you know as per law you in certain cases you are not required to file the return and in all other cases you are required to file the return so first thing is 15g 15h is not relevant according to me what is more important is how much is your income your father's income for mother's income whatever it is if the income was above the threshold limit then you have to file the return forget income the gross income before the etc and etg and d and all the deduction if the gross income was about 2 and 1/2 lakhs then the parent had to file the return of income and if you have filed the return of income just because you have filed it is picked up for scrutiny not possible what could be possible is that there was some problem of complete mismatch of income in the 26 as and the uh, return which you have filed that could be the reason but otherwise and for small tax payers they are not interested also so it is not that because of that but because of some other reason and now they have to give the reasons for why they are selecting for scrutiny so it is not that simple ke aise hi le liya you know it doesn't work that mention is computer assistant scrutiny 
No, so in fact in computer aided uh, assisted scrutiny, some whatever, the CASS, you have every right to ask him the reasons for the selection. You can ask and they have to tell you. Sir, the last page. Sir, most of the issue of manual previous certificate, is it valid? No. Because you are saying it is automatic. It's not, it's invalid. It's invalid. That has also been raised, like what he mentioned. Same thing. He mentioned that the credit. No, not the forget the credit. So I told you earlier, don't worry about the TDS certificate. Worry whether it is there in 26 years. The TDS certificate is the piece of junk now. You don't require it. We are filing returns. We have started filing returns. Why we were not able to file the returns up till now? Because 26 AS was not updated for our clients. Now people, all the TDS returns have got filed one after the other. Most clients. The 26 AS is showing the correct figures. No, you check your 26 AS. No, you go online. Not NSDL. Income tax is also giving. If it is 26 AS, even our banks, banks are also giving. Okay, I don't know about. I would prefer to go online and download myself. See, sorry, uh, sorry, I'll come back to you, but you, what you said is extremely dangerous. How can your bank give you 26 years? No, 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 if he, has given, you hand, regular, if he has given you handwritten certificate, it is bogus. It has, first of all, it has no value, you know, because he, they are not allowed to give handwritten certificate. You have to give through the system. There is no choice. But they are not giving, sir. They are I not know, giving I know. The well, I, I already system. agreed with and you. They are not even regularly updating on 26 years. That is becoming a very big problem. They are doing a favor by returning your NSC money to you. My international is not understanding them. And they, they just put your uh, uh, penalty on you. And what? They don't make the payment for few months. Yeah. So. So how can we, you know, counter that? I mean, they make the, they deduct the amount, let's say, in the March, March of the financial year, and they make us the payment after about two, three months. Make you the payment of what? The fees. Fees, yes. Huh. That has nothing to do with tax, no. But the tax is. But that they have to. There is no choice, na. Tax, as I showed you the timeline, the due dates, etc. They are forced to do that. There is no choice. 31st March, the tax has to be paid by 30th April. There is no choice. If they don't do it, the expense gets disallowed. They have to pay interest, penalty, prosecution, everything is there. Whereas, if they don't pay you, you are not going to prosecute him. You are mm -hmm. not going to charge him interest. In your invoice, you will write, pay in 15 days or I will charge you 18%. No, not have you ever, I am just thinking, even we have do that. Nobody does that. So, that is something between you and the your, you know, that other party. Nothing to do with tax you know, because tax they have to deduct. Where is the choice? But then, when I have to file my uh, return, it is reflected in the March, uh, in the previous uh, financial year. What is reflected? Uh, the tax deducted. Yeah, so that's what I meant. So, so, so again, it all depends on your method of account. Ah, uh, huh, exactly. Sir, so I was working for a company for the last six months. They have deducted my TDS, but they are refusing to give me TDS certificate. Again, I said, check your 26 AS. If it is there in 26 AS, then it doesn't matter. No need of physical DTS certificate. No need. In the normal course, no need. If it is there in 26 AS, again, I repeat for the nth number of times, you are safe. Because the system in the income tax department is not looking at your DTS certificate. They are doing matching electronically between your return 26 AS. I sell a property on power of attorney which, which belongs to the family. I accept on behalf of the family members 50 lakhs. Now how do I avoid tax? Because I have got to, I have got to distribute it five ways. 
first of all, I can't I'm answer. Like no, I, first of all, if the question is about avoiding tax, I can't answer it. <laughs> if the question is about how to go about the taxation, so in your case, as I understand, there are five family members who jointly own a property. They have given a power of attorney to you and you have executed the deal. Right. And they buy, uh, the buyer has given you the money and now you have to hand over. So first of all, you are not the seller. You are just a, a constituted attorney or a, a account holder, I mean power of attorney holder, correct? So you are not the seller first of all. So as far as the sale deed is concerned, for heaven's sake, don't put your pan. If the, the names of the five owners has got to be there. In that, in the recital, there will be that they have appointed you as a sort of a constituted attorney and then you are executing it on their behalf, correct? So in the deed, the five people's names should be there, their pan should be there, correct? You are going there only as their sort of agent and that being the case, when the buyer from the buyer, because TDS is, that fellow has to deduct, correct? The buyer has to deduct. Yes. You have to tell him that, suppose it is 60 lakhs for example, the sale price is 60, so it is above 50 lakhs. Therefore, TDS is applicable. So, what you have to tell him is that there are five sellers, not one seller. Five sellers, each one share is 12 lakh each, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. 12 lakhs is not exceeding 50 lakhs, and therefore tax is not deductible. And therefore, it's not an avoidance or an evasion. It is a clear case of TDS not being applicable. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Sir, you said that uh, uh, <coughs> someone has to deduct if the uh, service charges exceed 30,000 or some uh, Con contract, contract. Con contract charges. So contract it also include the service for example uh, we have taken some service for our society from you let us say no. uh, chartered accountant or a advocate. That particular section or a uh, this one ah, yes. section is 194C. Ah deals with payment to contractors and subcontractors and this one yeah. professional fees and fees ah, for technical ah, 30,000 no. that I am referring to sir ah, so there is no 30,000 if you may 30, pay 000. me more than 30 you have to deduct okay. there is no ah, contract or anything I am just talking about the society because uh, so society uh, generally would pay to a lawyer as somebody else also mentioned you are going in for redevelopment or kuch jagda ho gaya, you hire a lawyer no, but we are not directed then what is the consequence <laughs> consequence <laughs> first one is not applicable to you second so who will be prosecuted? The, the secretary and the chairman. You can take a printout of this in your managing committee meeting. Show this. To whom I have to complain? If I want to initiate complaint, then whom I have to complain? No, you need to take it up at the committee uh, at the society level, no? Because ultimately society. Any. Whom to complain means you can't complain to the income tax department because then they will definitely levy, uh, you know, cause problem for the society. What you need to tell, uh, what what where you need to take up is at the society level. That in your managing committee you have to write a letter to them and say that I am told by someone that you know the society should have deducted tax, uh, you know, and you have not deducted. Please look into the matter because there are serious consequences. So that is the only thing that you can do. Otherwise.